Hey, what is up everybody? This is Steve the Breach coming to you here today with a uh, Gemini style video. Um, this is going to be talking about the self-destruction of Ultimate Warrior. We haven't done a video like this, honestly, in a long time uh, where we hold up a uh, classic DVD, uh, talk about what's on it, talk about um, our feelings on it. And uh, I, I was doing a classic rerun of an old podcast that I used to love uh, to listen to uh, last week with a lot of podcasts having the week off for the uh, the week of 4th of July. Um, I ended up getting back into Russell Crap Radio and uh, the episode that I listened to today uh, was about the time period of the self-destruction of Ultimate Warrior. They talked about the release of his DVD and uh, their thoughts at it at the time. So I said, hey, I haven't watched this, honestly, in years. I haven't looked at it, honestly, in years. Let's pull this off the shelf and, and really deep dive into really what's going on with this. Uh, this is a DVD that came out around 2005. Um, you know, Ultimate Warrior was really on the outs uh, with the, the people of WWF at the time. Uh, WWE was, you know, getting into the sort of documentary-style releases of documentaries um, on their DVDs. They really... They, they really kicked that into gear around 2002 when they were going with like Triple H, NWO, uh, and they were rolling them out. Uh, they, I, I can remember The Undertaker in my yard. They didn't really know, did they want to go 100% exposing the business? Did they want to pull back a little bit and show kayfabe? Um, did they really want to talk about what goes on behind the scenes? Did they want to talk about Vince being in charge and you know pulling the strings and all that? They were, they were figuring it out. Uh, but this DVD, honestly, was one of the ones that sort of got me in the groove of, um, and it was probably, honestly, this podcast uh, that, that let me know that the self-destruction of Ultimate Warrior was out. Um, you know, one of them said that he watched it and said that it was good. The other one said he couldn't get his hands on it because he couldn't find it. That probably drove in my brain a little bit that I got to get my hands on this thing um, at the time. And... Um, uh, this this one is wild and it's crazy and it was a hard one to get your hands on at the time. Um, in 2005, this is around the time of WrestleMania 21. Um, WWE wasn't really 100% pop culture. Uh, the day that a DVD would drop live at like a Best Buy, they might have two copies. They they weren't definitely bringing in ten. Um, it was definitely you know get your hands on it at that time. It really was 100%. People weren't going to Amazon. Uh, for 100% of the things they buy in the house, so like a book, a movie, a CD. Most people were going to the mall still, uh, or a, a store around the mall in order to be able to pick this bad boy up. Um, I, I remember that I ended up buying the self-destruction of Ultimate Warrior really lucky. I used to really love DVDs at the time. I loved DVD collecting, not just wrestling. Um, this is the one that really kicked me, me off into having a wrestling collection because... Around the time of WrestleMania 21, I was just getting back into wrestling. It was going to a GameStop and seeing the WrestleMania 20 um, DVD there and wanting to pick it up for the greatest hits of WrestleMania's bonus disc as well as the documentary on WrestleMania uh, 19. That, you know, once I watched those, I was like, I might as well watch this. I watched the show. I uh, didn't think it was that bad, and I, I tuned in around, right around the time of WrestleMania 21. So this is me getting back into wrestling as well as, like, uh, finding this. I believe I found this, if I'm 100% right, I think I found it at a GameStop at a different one, the one that was actually in the mall, uh, and, and buying it just because I wanted to see the documentary. Uh, I remember a few times I bought some older do um, doc uh, um documentaries uh, at like the, uh, the Chris Benoit as well as the Eddie Guerrero ones just because I wanted to see the actual feature because there wasn't a way to see the feature any other way. I bought it, watched it, and I took it back to the same store and traded it in for, for more DVDs at the time. Um, stupid of me that I wouldn't hold on to it. But like I said, this started the run. I believe it was like the self-destruction of Ultimate Warrior, the Rob Van Dam, the Legion of Doom, the Mr. Perfect. And then all of a sudden I was like, I got a lot of wrestling DVDs. I, I guess I collect these now. And I have the collection that I have now. Um, the self-destruction of Ultimate Warrior was basically breaking down one of your heroes. And sort of exposing um, the behind-the-scenes things that was out there on the internet. Because a lot of people at this time were watching High Spots as well as RF video shoot interviews. And people like Bobby Heenan. 
uh, were telling stories about getting hurt by the Ultimate Warrior and how the guy really didn't have a clue what was going on. Um, but this was put out by WWE, a guy that you know was with them for a good portion of their career. And you can say what you want to about the Ultimate Warrior. Um, he's not my favorite wrestler, but uh, there are times when I see him in clips and things, or I see um, his Hasbro figure, that I get good memories. I can honestly tell you that I remember the day I turned on Wrestling Challenge after WrestleMania VI, and I saw Warrior in the opening of the show holding up the title, shooting laser beams out of his eyes. That was how I found out that Hulk Hogan lost. I was mad. <laughs> I, st I still have emotions towards the Ultimate Warrior that, that were, weren't there. Um, but, but this uh, documentary, honestly, uh, is going to be uh, the Ultimate Warrior, a household name and icon in sports entertainment, a driven guitar beat herald, uh, his explosion to the ring with the signature armbands and face paint. His intensity uh, was an unpar unparalleled. His controversial personality is equally unmatched. Learn about the man and the myth from the people who witnessed his uh, meteoric rise to the WWE Championship and the victory over Hulk Hogan before 65,000 fans at WrestleMania 6. Hear from the superstars who worked with the man. Did he burn out or drop out? Relive his feuds with the Macho Man Randy Savage, Rick Rude, Hulk Hogan, and more. Exclusive interviews with Vince McMahon and Eric Bischoff break down Ultimate Warrior stints in WWE and WCW. Find out exactly what happened at SummerSlam 1991 when the Ultimate Warrior held up the WWE for money. So they're basically exposing... It'd be like if your boss sat down and did a shoot interview about what he feels about you. I think everybody has pushed their boss a little bit trying to get something or, um, you know, they basically try, try to get their worth. Whether if it's money, whether if it's time off, whether if it's certain shifts on the schedule, that, that's basically what this is. I can remember that it has a lot of talking heads on there. Um, Bruce Pritchard, before he was Bruce Pritchard, I guess you can say. Um, Bobby Heenan, the Brooklyn Brawler. Around this time when they were making DVDs like this, they found out that they get royalties for what they were going to be on there. So there's a lot of guys that m sat down and it was their job to make these. Found out that they put themselves in them, their royalties go up even more. Um, Christian, Edge, guys that were on the roster at the time. They grew up, um, you know, liking the Ultimate Warrior, do personality, like sort of... Um, promos, <laughs> I, I guess you can say by him. Um, but like I said, the Warrior was, was never one of my favorite guys. Um, sitting down, I can say he's, uh, you know, the matches that I remember are definitely is the good one against Hogan, the bad one in WCW against Hogan, the two Rick Rude matches, the one at WrestleMania, the one that made him into SummerSlam, the, um, the match made in hell from SummerSlam 1991. I know that he had house show matches against Andre that I've heard about that were really, really short that Andre was putting him over on his way out. Um, I know that he had angles against uh, The Undertaker as well as Jake the Snake Roberts that because of the way he was, never ever came out on stage, but they had really good buildups to matches that never happened. Um, I can remember his squash match when his return came at WrestleMania. I believe that was in Los Angeles, so that would be 12. And other than that, I'm kind of out of matches, so I'm, I'm, I'm surprised um, that they've put on here his debut match against Terry Gibbs. Hunk oh, the Hunky Tonk Man match at SummerSlam 88. Title versus title at 90. SummerSlam 1990 against Rude. Macho, oh, the Macho Man match is a retirement match. That, that is a very memorable match. Probably one of his best matches right there. Um, on the bonus disc, uh, if you run out and buy this at most stores, it's just going to be the single disc. Bonus disc, I think, was exclusive to, I want to say, Circuit City. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but you got a match against Hercules from the Madison Square Garden in 88. Sergeant Slaughter on uh, Saturday night's main event against 1991. Of course, he lost the championship at the Rumble 90. I got a, a good story about that one as well. Uh, and then you've got the uh, Randy Macho Man uh, SummerSlam 1992 match, which is very unforgettable. I have no memories of that match. And I've even watched that match since I've got back into wrestling twice. Still don't really remember anything about it. Um, Ultimate Warrior was a controversial guy. Because of this DVD, 
This came out around the time of WrestleMania 21. WrestleMania 26, you can remember Ted DiBiase is your main eventer going into the Hall of Fame. It's because they wanted Warrior. Warrior still had bad feelings against the WWE that only grew because of this. And he talks about it a lot in both of his shoot interviews that he did, one with the toy company, one that he did on his own, which I believe might be able to still find on YouTube. I'm not 100% sure. But, um, yeah, he did not like this at all. And the fact that WWE thought that they were going to wave a payday um, in, in his face to come back at WrestleMania 26 until... They, they just kept thinking that he was going to do it. Why they go, didn't go out and get somebody... I love Ted DiBiase, somebody, a stronger name to main event. They, they, you know, they were coming off of um, WrestleMania 25, which had a real star-started one. They'll, they'll never be able to top WrestleMania 21, which was Hulk and Piper. But, um, you know, they were trying to make the, 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 the um, Hall of Fame into something. And, of course, 27, they get Sean. 28, they get Edge. They started getting lucky after that. But, you know, 26, really bad class. They didn't get Warrior until 30. And that was a lot due to Triple H coming back. Once he came back, there's two more ones that you can pick up. We've already talked about these. Um, this one came out before um, his death. Uh, before his Hall of Fame induction, the Ultimate Warrior, the Ultimate Collection of Matches, just a ton of matches. And then we've got Always Believe, which is a, um, a super cut of his WrestleMania 30 documentary about coming back to the company, um, what his thoughts were until the time he signed the contract. Um, it shows him, you know, you know, showing up to New Orleans and all of the emotions uh, till he left and uh, had the heart attack um, in, back in Phoenix, but... Ultimate Warrior, not one of my favorite guys. I am going to sit down now. I am going to watch the documentary, so I should have a review up uh, on this sooner than later. But um, a very weird, very, very weird um, release. Um, a lot of people thought maybe the Lex Luger WWE Network documentary that was supposed to come out, I believe, three years ago on the 4th of July, uh, which was re-edited into the A&E documentary, was supposed to be a little bit in the likes of this. Um, they did touch, of course, on the Lex um, um, and Miss Elizabeth uh, tragedy at the end of Miss Elizabeth's career. Um, not like they did with the WWE Confidential um, TV show, which was just a huge burial um, at the time of Lex Luger. Um, but um, we'll have to see. I'm lucky enough to have the two discs uh, set in my... Um, collection, like I said, that's the one you're looking for. I believe it was a Circuit City release. Nothing really major on here, honestly, guys. Just a few interviews and a few matches. But everybody wants it. Peace out. Hey, what is up, everybody? This is Stevie Breach coming to you here today. I was able to sit down and watch the self-destruction of Ultimate Warrior. Um, I'm honestly making this video quite possibly two hours after I made the last one uh, doing like the Gemini style video what I talked about where I just basically showed off the DVD and uh, gave my thoughts about what I remembered about it and uh, what I thought was going to be it and just basically what's on it because I'll tell you the truth there's a lot of people out there that have probably never seen this DVD it came out close to 20 years ago back in 2005 um, you know, DVDs quite honestly aren't as popular as they once were. A lot of the uh, newer fans uh, or even fans that are returning um, to, to wrestling or just, you know, firing up Peacock and watching what is on there. One of the reasons why I think the Ultimate Warrior came back at the time that he came back um, to WWE, I, I, I'm not quite sure that it was, you know, the, the time that he felt, you know, that... Uh, Bygones could be bygones between him, Vince, Triple H, Hulk Hogan, uh, for the things that were said in the past. And one of the biggest um, problems that they had was this DVD and all the negative things that Bobby Heenan and Bruce Prichard, um, you know, uh, Jim Ross, Triple H, um, basically anybody that was ever involved in the business with him uh, came out negative, you know. Honestly, watching this, I thought Hulk Hogan came out pretty positive of Ultimate Warrior. He did talk about wanting to break uh, Warrior's leg at uh, SummerSlam 1991, which we'll get into in a few minutes. Um, but didn't really say anything over-the-top negative that I thought he would have said that uh, when Warrior came back at WrestleMania 30, um, they had to... Uh, 
you know, shake hands. And the story was that Vince told uh, Hulk Hogan that he had to stay away from the Ultimate Warrior. But uh, Warrior was looking for, I'm sorry, Hogan was looking for Warrior, ran into him, didn't know what was going to happen, but thought that Warrior might run away. But they stood there, they shook hands, they said they were sorry. And um, then now Hogan can say that when uh, Warrior passed away, that all was, was right in the world, just like he does with saying that him and Savage ran into each other at a doctor's office. Um, and because of the story Hogan tells, I don't think many people believe that story. Um, but um, I'll, I'll say honestly, th watching this documentary, the one reason that came to my mind was that maybe Warrior came back to WWE at WrestleMania 30, um, was the fact that the network was being launched at that time. It had been launched a month before. Maybe Warrior wanted to make sure that this documentary didn't see the light of day on the WWE Network at that time, which uh, was basically putting put up that all of the documentaries uh, that had been on DVD at the time, all of the pay-per-views, um, you know, basically any special that WWE had ever run before, was going to be there and maybe that was one of the selling points is that they could come back and they could rewrite their wrongs and they can make a documentary on the ultimate warrior that would suit both sides they'd be able to tell the positive stories they'd be able to tell the negative stories and warrior be able to give his side of the story of the controversy that would come from the way that he worked when he first came into the, yeah, what happened between him and Vince at SummerSlam 1991 uh, when Warrior held him up for money. You know, what happened when Warrior disappeared after coming back after WrestleMania 8? What happened after Warrior disappeared after the King of the Ring match with Jerry the King Lawler after he came back at WrestleMania 12? Um, you know, why did Vince keep bringing him back? And why did Warrior keep breaking Vince's heart, I guess you can say. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why uh, the Always Believe documentary came out so fast. I believe it came out within two weeks after WrestleMania 30, after Ultimate Warrior passed away. They finished off this documentary that was basically the same thing as the network special um, within a few months of, of WrestleMania, honestly. So... Um, you know, that, that I think that's honestly one of the reasons why when they sat down with Warrior and they said, we'll sell these t-shirts, we'll sell this kind of stuff on the documentary, sitting at the table in Titan Towers, um, it's pro pro probably one of the things that they put out there and said they could rewrite the wrong by making another documentary, putting it out on, on the network and such like that. But um, they didn't spend a lot of time on this documentary, really breaking down Ultimate Warrior, getting into the wrestling business. They flew through it pretty fast about the birth of the Dingo Warrior, um, you know, his coming up, being a, a tag team partner with Sting. You got to think in 2005, Sting was wrestling in TNA, so he couldn't really do um, an interview. Uh, you know, at the same time, Warrior wasn't in WWE, so he couldn't do the interview. Um, so they basically were having the story told through the likes of like Ted DiBiase, Jerry the King Lawler, um, and it was all sort of hearsay stuff about what was going on. Um, you know, that he basically uh, went into Mid-South, which then he left because they said it was too physical and he didn't like the beating that his body was taking. Uh, he ended up going to Dallas, which then ended up putting him into Memphis, um, and that got him to the WWF where he was put into feuds with Hercules Hernandez, which then led to the feuds between him and Bobby Heenan, which then led to him against uh, Andre the Giant, uh, which led to um, the Rick Rude feud. Um, you know, he doesn't have a lot of feuds. In the last video, I talked about the fact that I could name probably five matches um, that I really remember him being in. It, honestly, the answer is six. Um... Uh, and it's just, it's, it's it's not a whole bunch. Possibly his best match can be debated against WrestleMania 6 or WrestleMania 7, um, whether if it's the match against Hogan for the WWF Championship or the match against Randy Savage, um, career versus career, which is crazy that he puts his career on the line at WrestleMania 7. And at the point, WrestleMania 8, he's able to just straight up just come back to the company. 
I, as a kid, I didn't even realize he was gone. I'll tell you the truth, whether if maybe he was off doing like a No Holds Barred movie uh, like Hogan did when he disappeared, whether if he had an injury, but it never really was put out, you know, we're letting you go, and, and he, he disappeared and he wasn't there. Um, there was a lot of fallings out with him between him and Vince, which came between um, money. Um, you know, Warrior wanted to be paid like he was Hulk Hogan. Um, you know, he was being put out there like he was the champion of the company, like he was the main guy. Um, and he just wanted a fair shake. That if he was going to be the main event, he was going to be carrying the towns uh, because Hogan wasn't wrestling on all of them. He just wanted the same amount, which honestly, in my book, is fair. Uh, but but uh, Vince didn't want to start cutting more people, more pieces of the, the pie, as big as he'd already given Hogan. Uh, but then again, Hogan had got him through like six of the biggest years in the, in, in the company, uh, from WrestleMania 1 all the way until WrestleMania 6, when he passed the torch um, to Ultimate Warrior. Um, so SummerSlam, match made in heaven, match made in hell, um, you know, they... they, they they do business. Vince gives them the money, but then and, and um, that he wants, but then imme immediately fires him as he comes through uh, the thing and just like you're done, go home. Um, both of those guys trade lawsuits back and forth. Uh, it ends up, uh, you know, a year later, Hogan saying that he's gonna walk away. Vince is flipping out, like, what am I gonna do? He brings back the Ultimate Warrior. Um, Ultimate Warrior, it, it honestly doesn't last long. I think at this point is during the steroid trial. Uh, Warrior ended up getting busted with steroids. He, I think he failed a test. It was him and the British Bulldog. Um, and, and and they have to go. Um, you know, see you later. It's a couple of years goes around and uh, you know, Warrior pops back up. He, he comes back into WrestleMania. He wrestles against Triple H. Comes back. He has a match. Um, against Jerry the King Lawler. And I think at this point, um, Warrior just starts no-showing houses. Maybe the, the, the business is down. Money isn't what he thought it was going to be. Um, and maybe it's just he hadn't been wrestling in a while and it was hard on his body and he, he couldn't do it night after night, um, you know, being the star of the company. Uh, I'm not quite sure. But, you know, this was sort of like the, the writing on the wall for Vince that this isn't going to work. And uh, he lets the guy go. Um, you know, that that's, of course, when he sits out for another couple of years. And I think when Vince brought him back for that short run of WrestleMania, it's because WCW was kicking his ass and he needed anything he could throw against the wall to give him a little bit of a jump. We get to the point where WCW is losing their audience. Um, I believe this was for um, this Halloween Havoc 98. Uh, you know, they ended up bringing Warrior to WCW. Um, Warrior, of course, had to go into the courts, change his name. Um, you know, his real name at this time of death was Ultimate Warrior. <laughs> and, um, of course, his kids were named Warrior. His wife was named Dana Warrior. Um, it's kind of crazy that you want to own your character so much. Um, which is one of the reasons why, like, DiBiase's against them, Ric Flair's against them. These guys couldn't believe that um, Warrior didn't understand that the wrestling business owns your name. You know, that basically, Vince promoted him. Vince uh, was the reason he became what he is today. Um, I don't know. Ric Flair is the same guy that, through a technicality, sent the WCW slash NWA championship to Vince for his debut uh, into WF when he had a falling out with WCW back 1990, was that one? 1992? Somewhere, somewhere in that, you know, so it's basically kind of the same thing. Um, you know, it's just, I, I don't know, it's just kind of nuts. Um, the, the WCW thing doesn't really last that long. Him and Hogan have a horrible match at Halloween Havoc. A lot of people say that, you know, basically Hogan talked WCW into bringing him in just to get that win back. There was lots of talks about, um, WCW bringing in Yokozuna, uh, so he could get that win back. But just, if you look at Hulk Hogan's time in WCW, a lot of it was just trying to 
get ground, especially in those early days, by just beating the same guys that he had beat. Like, this worked before. Let's see if it works again, whether if it's the shark, whether if it's, uh, you know, the macho man. He wasn't really going out there and wrestling um, against new guys. It was just, give me the honky-tonk man. Give me, you know, this, that, and the other. People ate it up once, they'll eat it up again. I think Hogan knew that something uh, was going to be cooking in the works with, you know, people, you know, remembering the past and that being a big deal. But he just was 10, 15 years too early <laughs> before, you know, people were going to start, you know, wanting what their childhood was um, back in the day. Um, I'll tell you the truth. If you've never seen the self-destruction of the Ultimate Warrior, this is not a DVD you need to go really searching for. Um, I, I couldn't find the documentary on YouTube or anything like that. But I, I, I tell you, honestly, the AEW documentary um, is, is really, really good. They came out a couple of years ago. Um, I'll tell you that um, the, uh, Beyond the Beyond the Ring, I think that's what it's called. Um, that was really good. That just sort of talks about him getting into WBF, sort of told through his ex-wife's uh, perspective. Um, come on, man. we got two minutes here before I'm done. Um, uh, and uh, the Always Believe. Really, really good. If you go on the um, WWE Network on Peacock, it's under a different name. Uh, I can't remember what it was, but it's basically the story of him coming back to, to WWE. Um, I don't know. It's a whole lot of, uh, of hubbub. I'm sure it made WWF a good deal of money around WrestleMania 21 back in 2005. But uh, honestly, in today's world, it just doesn't uh, hold up. And uh, it's not what it should be. Especially paying extra money for the collector's edition. Not really sure what these go for, but if you're looking for it, you can find it. They're not horribly hard to find. You're just going to pay for it because people know what they got. And there's, you know, at the time you're going to be looking for it, not many people are going to be selling it. Selling it, So you got to pay whatever they want. So peace out, everybody. Destruction of the Ultimate Warrior. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Good old WWE uh, video in 2023.